Hello and welcome to the fourth presentation in the Trees Such and Wallen by Wood Science Center virtual conference series. This conference series was initiated to contribute to the scientific discussion in a time where conferences have been cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The full program is found at the TreeSearch webpage. My name is Josephine Illegord, and today I'm here to present today's speaker, Stefan Roth, a Beamline Manager at DESI in Hamburg and adjunct professor at KTH. Stefan, uh, uh, Stefan will present large area cellulose nanofiber thin films, observing their fabrication and functionality in situ. In his research, Stefan is focusing on creating functional coatings for sustainable materials. You in the audience can interact and ask questions or comment via YouTube chat function. For that, you need to be logged in and have a YouTube account and a YouTube channel. If you don't have any account, you can text the questions in the number found in the notes. Any questions will be answered after the presentation that would last approximately 30 minutes. With that, I hand over to Stefan, who is now in Germany. Yeah, thank you very much, Josephine, for this nice introduction. And, and hello to everyone from Germany to Germany and everywhere else. It's a pleasure to have this lecture today. And I will now start sharing the screen. Yeah, again, welcome to my lecture. I will give a lecture on large area cellulose and nanofiber thin films observing their fabrication and functionality in C2. To start with, let's take a look into layer by layer coating. There are many liquid based processes or solution based processes where you can perform coatings, fabricate coatings in a layer by layer manner. For example, spin coating, you have a rotating substrate and you put on a droplet and this droplet is spread due to the rotational motion and the solvent evaporates and you can install a thin film. Another example is dip coating where you have a trough with a solution or a dispersion and you put your substrate in and you drag it out and you do capillary forces and evaporation of the, of the solvent a nanostructure is installed. One third method, which I will mainly use here in my talk and where I will present the results is spray coating. Here you have a spray device, for example, an airbrush device. You have here the feed in for the liquid on the solvent. You have here then a, a gas supply and you can dispos uh, deposit here the liquid film on a surface, let it dry and install a nanostructure. As you have seen here already, we will use scattering methods to observe the patterning or fabrication process during spray coating or do different coating procedures in general in C2. This will be one part of my talk and I will explain you the basics of the scattering in order to understand what we see here in these images. Well, when we talk about spray coating, just a few keywords is a very established technique. It's compatible to row to row coating with, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, about 20 meters per minute uh, displacement velocity. And you can do advanced three-dimensional coating as well as nanostructure. And the question we want to answer is, how do the process properties from the fabrication process affect the layer or multi-layer properties? The outline of my talk is hence as follows. First, I give a short introduction into spray coating. Then I will present you the basics of X-ray characterization. As a first example of spray coating application example, I show you the surface functionalization using latex colloids. Then I show you towards layer by layer coating, the methodology, how we can produce multi-layer systems using spray coating. Then we go into the structure formation during spray coating of cellulose and nanofibril films. And finally, we look into the hybridization of the installed CNF films, which is very important if you want to functionalize a CNF surface due to 
the uh, affiliation to water. So let's start with the introduction to spray coating. Spray coating, the principle is shown here. It's basically atomization and droplet transport during the spray coating process. You have here a nozzle, here a liquid reservoir, you have a gas inlet. The gas inlet having a certain pressure drags out the liquid, installs a two phase flow. And at the end of the nozzle, this two phase flow breaks up first into filaments and then into smaller droplets. In the spray cone, you can distinguish three regimes, the dense regime, the dilute regime and the very dilute regime. And we are often working in the dilute or very dilute regime where we have single droplets uh, impinging on the surface. Parameters which you have to take care of when you want to install a nanostructure is of course the nozzle to sample distance. Um, this determines in which um, regime you are working, the gas pressure and the liquids, for example, their boiling points. Furthermore, when you have here your substrate, you can install, depending on the distance, a more or less pronounced accelerated wall flow. This means that part of the material due to the gas pressure is pushed to the outside and with the ongoing evaporation, you can install nanostructures. And this is exactly what I'm showing here, the accelerated wall flow we used to install nanostructures or multiple length scale structures with 100 nanometer polystyrene colloids. Here is a top view on the left side. You see here a microscopy image of the installed colloidal film. You see already here that we have an outward um, direction or a direction of nanostructures of structures pointing outward. This is 100 micron scale. You see here these lines. This is a zoom in into these lines and you see that they are well more or less ordered. They are consisting of 100 nanometer colloids. And if you zoom in with an AFM, you see that these individual, um, call it elongated trapezoids, are consisting of three layers of these 100 nanometer polystyrene colloids. And this is depicted here. Another example, I adapted this from Gero Decher's work, is the spray assisted layer by layer assembly using CNFs. Here he used grazing incidence or oblique incidence spray coating to align the CNF. In the former example, our spray cone was like this. Here, the group of Geodecha tilted the spray nose and used a very small distance. And when you spray on, you have here a flow indicated by this arrows induced by the gas flow. And you make use of this accelerated wall shear flow and you can create on a large scale, here shown with an AFM, such aligned cellulose nanofibrils. Of course, this is then very important if you want to create directional materials. After this motivation, why we do spray coating, let me introduce to you the basics of X-ray characterization. In our case here, we want to investigate thin films. We are using also, small angle and wide angle X-ray scattering, abbreviated SUX and WAX, but in grazing incidence mode. First, I look into GWAX. In grazing incidence mode, the beam impinges under a low angle, typically below one degree onto the surface, and is scattered. Depending where you put your detector, close to the sample or farther away, you are in the GWAX or GSUX regime, typically the distance at the typical energies of the photon beam we use is uh, 5 to 10, 15 centimeters for the GWAX and for GZAX around 1 meter to up to 10 meters. You will see that we can observe here different features of the sample. When we are in the GWAX position or GWAX regime, we can observe the crystallinity and the crystal orientation. I have depicted this here. We picture here the crystallites which we deposited by spray coating, for example, on the sample surface. Here as squares and uh, the lattice planes are indicated as blue lines. They have a distance T. Then in reciprocal space, you observe these arcs. The position of these arcs, their distance is two pi over D in the simplest case, and gives you thus um, a measure of the lattice planes and of the crystallinity. Secondly, you see that we have some kind of disorder here, the crystals are tilted and hence the lattice planes are tilted. This gives rise to a broadening 
of these normally perfect rack spots. So you can deduce from this measurement the orientation of your crystal lights and um, the lattice plane spacing. Secondly, now we take a go a step back. We put our detector farther away and we are in the GSAX regime. Again, our beam impinges on the very low angle below one degree on the sample surface. And we have here now a different scattering pattern. Actually, this is a scattering pattern of 100 nanometer colloids made of polystyrene. This is very structured. We see many features, many, many maxima. We have here a reciprocal space coordinate system, QY and QZ. Remember, reciprocal space means that we can correlate it with the real space length as one over length scale. When I now follow the intensity on this two-dimensional detector along QY, along or parallel to the sample, I obtain such a structured curve here. Intensity as a function of QY. You see this curves are side maxima, which indicate the most prominent distance, in that case, the distance of the colloids. They are also called pseudo rack fields. When I now look in vertical direction along the surface normal or vertical to the sample surface, I have such a curve here. This is the so-called specular reflective peak, um, which means that at this position, the exit beam has the same angle as the incident beam. We see here fringes. These fringes can be correlated to the height of the nanoparticles. And we see further here the so-called UNIDA peak. This is an interference phenomenon here called YPS and YSEOX in our case. And this, um, critic, this uh, UNIDA peak occurs at the so-called critical angle of the material and is thus a measure of the density or the porosity of the material. So to summarize, when we analyze this two-dimensional scattering pattern, we obtain nanoparticle radii and distances from this Interrupt from this cut here, and SQZ features uh, shows features perpendicular to the sample surface. We can deduce the nanoparticle height as well as layer thicknesses. And this is now important for the remainder of this talk. As a first application, both of spray coating and of X ray scattering, I show you the surface functionalization using latex colloids. Here we observed thermal transformations in colloidal coatings and the aim was to tailor the water contact angle with minimal use of coating. As colloidal particles, we used core shell colloids. The shell was made of the MIMA and the core was made either of PMMA or of PMA, which means that the glass transition temperature is around 36 and 126 degrees centigrade. So very different and this has in the end, different, uh, this has different impact on the coalescence phenomenon. First of all, I show you here the pictorial view of the colloid. This is the core, and this is the uh, Gedeima shell. And the spray coating indeed shows you that we have here something uh, like 5% coverage. This is sprayed at room temperature, and then this whole system was heated up. You see already in the SEM images changes in the pattern. What we did then, we observed the whole structure with X-ray scattering. We performed GSAS tracing and small angle X-ray scattering. And we uh, observed here in this example on this slide, the so-called PMMA L colloids, meaning colloids with a core of PMMA and a hydrophilic shell of the MIMA. And all in all, they have a diameter of around about 96 nanometer and the core has a diameter of around about 50 nanometer. From the X-ray scattering, when we heat the sample and we take every, at every temperature a GSAX image, we can deduce the following features. Here, the dash lines indicates the radius of the core, while the solid red line indicates the distance of the nanoparticles. The black lines indicate the radius of larger structures as well as the distance. So and, uh, the interpretation is, it's of course clear, when we increase the temperature, even the radius of the PMMA core due to flattening will increase. This shows the slight increase or extends the slight increase in radius. The distance also increases starting from about 70 degree centigrade. The larger structures you can imagine as domains. As we increase the temperature, of course, 
the polymer chains become mobile and neighboring clusters might uh, coalesce. This means that the domains grow larger and larger in size and also the distance increases. So this is a very pictorial view of how you can visualize the thermal transformation and colloidal coating. What we did further, and please look here at the dark gray bar, we correlated this nanostructural change to the water contact angle. And you can see here that depending on the transformation temperature, we can really tune the water contact angle to a desired value between 62 and 79 degree centigrade. So in the next step, as I've shown already uh, in the title of my talk, we want to fabricate in a layer by layer way, multi-layer systems. So it's important to look into the methodology. To do so, we started to look in situ into the spray deposition. <clears throat> Here we used for this uh, experiment, a smaller nozzle to sample distance of 10 centimeters, usually we are using 20 to 30 centimeters. We sprayed 100 nanometer colloids in water on the surface. Total spray time was 0.1 seconds. We sprayed at room temperature, though the sample, in our case, a pure silicon wafer, is held at room temperature. Hydrogen pressure, which we use for spraying, is around one, is one bar. So on the left hand side, you see a video of the spray process. On the left, on the right hand side, you see the GSAX images, the video of the GSAX images. So, you see, we spray here on, and you already see right from the beginning grazing incidence small angle x ray pattern. This pattern changes with ongoing drying time. The total drying time is around 20 seconds. You see in the beginning first that here the middle peak broadened, and at one point you see here side maxima coming up. If you remember some slides beforehand, the side maxima indicate preferred distances. So we really create here an ordered structure of 100 nanometer colloids. To analyze this, we now look at the int intensity distribution along this line, along the horizontal uh, line cut, so to say, parallel to the sample surface. And this is done on the next slide. Here are shown all the cuts for all the images taken with two frames per second during the spray deposition and the subsequent drying. The Red curves depict the so-called early stage. You see here this early stage is characterized by a relatively sharp middle maximum and no structures outside. When the drying time continues, you see that this feature broadens and we come into the blue regime, this so-called intermediate stage. Here you see that this middle peak has twofold. On the one hand, it's still sharp, but the foot regime is already very much broad. And you see here, that some side maxima start coming up, meaning that during the drying, the colloids come closer and closer together as the solvent evaporates and the concentration of the colloids in the remaining film is increased. In the late or dry stage, of course, we have then these side maxima very well pronounced, indicating, as I said beforehand, a very good ordering of the colloidal nanoparticles. To better analyze this, I have averaged here from the three regimes all the curves. This is the early regime in red, the intermediate regime in blue, and here you see already this bordering and the coming up of these nice side peaks, which are very well pronounced in the late or the dry stage, depicted here in black. Here are the typical two-dimensional scattering patterns, and here's our pictorial view. In the beginning, as we are in a dense regime, we have here something like a liquid layer or a pool of the nanoparticles in water. The solvent evaporates, this liquid breaks up. We have the colloids confined in smaller droplets, then the water evaporates from the smaller droplets and we are left with an ordered structure, which is confirmed by these nice out of plane peaks, the pseudobrand peaks. So our aim, as I said, is to create multi-layer structures. In order to develop the methodology for creating multi-layers, we again use polystyrene colloids, the same colloids I've used beforehand, but this time we vary the substrate temperature. What we want to do here is to manipulate the assembly of spray deposit nanocolloids for monolayer film preparation. Then you put one layer on, the next layer, and the next layer, and then you can create really thick layers. Prerequisite, as you will see, is a suppression of the covering effect. Here we compared the spraying at room temperature as well as at 100 degrees centigrade. You already see when you spray at room temperature, 
you have here these colloids lumped or closely packed, if you want to say it a little bit finer, together. And when you spray on a substrate which is heated up to around 100 degrees centigrade, we have this colloid sparsely packed or sparsely uh, scattered on the surface. This is a big advantage because then I can, after the drying of the first spray pulse, just put a second spray pulse on and the colloids will subsequently fill the voids here in between or the empty areas in between the other colloids. Then you create one layer, then you spray the next layer on. This is depicted here, so we can confirm that we can suppress the, uh, the coffee ring effect. So, and here, just to show you, I show here all the line cuts, E of QY, so the structure formation along the parallel to the sample surface as a function of time for 54, 100, and 120 degrees centigrade. Look please here at the solid arrow and the dashed arrow. The time in between marks the position of the spray pulse of 0.1 second and the final dried sample system and nothing happens anymore. You see with increasing spray time, um, increasing substrate temperature, the time delay between spray pulse or sprayed on and dried is becoming smaller and smaller, going up to around about 50 milliseconds here at 100 degrees centigrade. And this is very important because when you do this at room temperature, you have to wait very long. When you heat it up to 120 degrees centigrade, you have only 50 milliseconds drying time. This means in a very short time, you can create very thick layers. And this is what we will make use of in this part of the talk, the structure formation during spray coating of CNF films. As I said, we use spray coating for layer by layer by layer formation, in our case, in that case here of enzymatic cellulose and nanofibril films. And we sprayed here thicknesses up to two micrometers. So what we did actually, we sprayed some nanometers on the surface, silicon dioxide, let it dry, measured the dried film in GWAX and GZAX, sprayed on, let it dry and measured again. First, what you do, of course, you compare this to AFM. This is the AFM topography, confirms that you really have sprayed CNF on the surface. Actually, we use two types of spraying. One, 100 to 200 times, uh, 200 times 0.4 second spraying with a 0.1 second break in between, and the other time, 10 times 0.4 second spraying, 0.1 second break, and 30 minutes drying between these individual spray deposits. Uh, spray uh, procedures. So in the first case, the film is not dry when we use the subsequent spray pulses, while here after 10 times, we wait and let the film dry. We did this at room temperature, hence the long drying time. And this is the result. You have here the number of spray pulses and here the film thickness. The black points indicate the, the first uh, spraying procedure and you see here, that somehow we are limited to around one micron film thickness. This is of course clear as we spray on an already liquid surface and the next spray pulse up or the 31st spray pulse, so to say, drives again away the liquid and hence the uh, film thickness even decreases. However, and this is shown here in light gray, when we use the second group with 30 minutes drying in between the uh, the spray procedures, we see that we have a linear growth of the film thickness with a number of spray pulses. At the same time, we monitor that uh, select at every thickness, the root mean square roughness, and you see also that the root mean square roughness levels off at one point to around 50 nanometers, starting from around 20 nanometer to 50 nanometer. So we stick now to the second one, the second uh, spray procedure as we, this allows us really to create thick films. And what we did first with grazing incidents, we used GWAX to observe the scattering pattern. The scattering pattern is composed here of the 1 minus 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 peak and the 2, 0, 0 peak of the CNF. CNF is partially crystalline, hence we can observe the Bragg scattering um, of the fibrils deposited on the surface. And in a very simple approach, first order approach, we observe the intensity here in this um, red marked region. And this is shown here, and here's the thickness of the films, here's the mean intensity. And of course, the mean intensity increases more or less linearly. 
because we deposit more and more CNFs off the surface. So this is a confirmation that we really have a layer by layer growth using the spray procedure with the drying time in between of our CNF films. And if you want, you can go up higher and higher, um, basically up to the point where you have no solution left. Of course, this is the topography and we want to learn more because we want to learn what is the inner structure of the film. And therefore we use grazing incidence, small angle X-ray scattering and make a full quantitative analysis. And what I show here is the result. I apologize here, the second three should be one. So three, two, one. And this is the result here. We find three length scales. The first length scales is around 5.6 nanometer. Of course, this is the individual fibril, its diameter. CNFs have a diameter of say five nanometer and a length of hundreds of nanometers to a micrometer. They have a certain distance of around about uh, 10, 15, 20 nanometer. Then we have a sub, we observe a second structure of 11 nanometer diameter and even a third structure of around about 26 nanometer. This shows that this homogeneous film has a certain porosity, has a certain inner structure because you can then interpret this as, okay, blue, this is the diameter of the individual CNF, red and black circles indicate agglomerations of these individual fibrils of different, into diff, uh, agglomerations of different size. And all what is white around here could be interpreted as voids. And this is actually what you want to fill when you want to create a functionalized nanopaper, for example, with a semiconducting polymer or with um, a certain functionalized ink. So this is then the basis for future applications for functionalization. So once you have installed this film, of course, it is important to look at its reaction. For example, the reaction due uh, on water, a hydratization of CNF films. In contrast to the film before, we do not use enzymatic cellulose, but tempo oxidized cellulose. And our idea was to spray nanopaper, as we call it, and to introduce a new process to produ produce extremely smooth cellulose layers on an industrial scale. And our idea is really to establish advanced porous templates with tailored chemical surface properties using sustainable materials. That is to say, spray cellulose on a surface and use it as a functional temp. Spraying, of course, because it's a scalable method and roll to roll compatible. And already here I state the result. We have an unprecedented ultra low roughness on a centimeter scale, homogeneity. This is the sample. It's up to 10 centimeters. The other samples I showed on the previous slides were all on the order of one to two centimeters. So we gained here an order of magnitude in sample size. And nowadays, even we can do the same on 50 meters with a roll to roll spray coater. And <clears throat> of course, you start here with investigating AFM. This is an optical image, this is an AFM image, proving you know, that we have really here coated these 10 centimeters with CNFs. So here, we installed, to be more detailed, using temper oxidized cellulose nanofibrils, a thickness of 200 nanometers. We used different surface charges shown here from minus 400 to minus 1400 micromole per gram. Here is the root mean square roughness plotted. This is the root mean square roughness of enzymatic cellulose. And as soon as you use charge temper oxidized cellulose, you see that the root mean square roughness tremendously goes down from 22 to roughly seven nanometers. And with increasing surface charge, the film gets smoother and smoother. We attribute this to the fact of the electrostatic repulsion between the uh, nanofibrils, which leads to a more stratified film. We also observe the water contact angle and due to the decreasing roughness, the water contact angle first goes down. However, at a critical charge of 1,000 micromole per gram, it goes up again, and we attribute this, that the electrostatic um, contribution takes over. At the same time, using scattering methods, grazing instant small angle X-ray scattering, of course, for these four samples, we can make a structural model. This is the intensity as a function of QY, so we monitor the structure parallel to the sample surface. For these four charges, I have shown here um, 
400, 800,000, 36 in micromol per gram, and in pink is the fit. For the fit, we use the so-called cylindrical model, as we used beforehand for the enzymatic cellulose. We observe here two structures, because we have only a limited Q range here. We are ending here around 0 0.4 inverse nanometers. These structures have a certain radius and a distance. I'll show you here the analysis. The structure which we call one is 56 nanometer in distance with a 26 nanometer diameter. D2 has 74 nanometer distance and a radius of eight nanometers. So this resembles more or less the uh, agglomeration we have seen with the enzymatic cellulose. Now, what we did is we used neutron scattering, raising instant small angle neutron scattering to observe the response of this 200 nanometer films to hydratization. The result is depicted here. These are first the out of plane cuts again, intensity as a function of QI, and in pink is a fit. From this fit, we can for each hydratization state 0%, 90%, and redried deduce the structures. You see here that our Q range or accessible reciprocal space is larger, and we can even here see the individual nanofibrils. This is what we have not seen with the x ray scattering because our detector was far, farther away or too far away to observe this. However, we see here the same structures as we see with the x ray scattering. and points uh, depicts the neutron scattering size, so x the x ray scattering results, and you see that it's very well fit. However, when you hydrate, you see at 0% relative humidity, you have a distance of these large structures around 57 nanometer, then it goes to 71 nanometer and back to 58. So there is uh, uh, some kind of reversibility in hydratization. Yet, in order to fit these curves properly, we can no longer use the cylindrical approach, but the larger structure have, according to our analysis, a spherical appearance. And this means that these large structures are mainly voids. And these large voids, we believe, are the voids which become filled when we want to functionalize our nanopaper. So to summarize, I have shown you how we can use spray coating to create large area cellulose nanofiber thin films. We use GZAX and GVAX to observe the structural length scales from the molecular level up to the nanoscale to some hundred nanometers. We are able to in situ observe the nanostructure formation during spray coating. We are able to apply layer by layer coating using spray coating. We have developed the methodology and applied this to CNF films. We are able to observe in situ the hydratization or the response to water vapor and using Grazing incidence methods, we are able to quantitatively analyze the structure function relationship, as I've shown, for example, here for surface functionalization. To finish, I would like to thank all the people involved in this project, especially Calvin Brett, who is a PhD student, together with Daniel Söderberg. The colloidal in situ spray deposition part was done by Frank Zhang in my group. For Eva Milestone, we collaborate on the project of surface functionalization and for scattering. Methods. I thank Peter Miller Buschbaum and Martin Munson, also my group here at DESI, and many more, and of course, you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. And now we invite you in the audience to ask questions, uh, just to uh, use the live chat function to. Uh, to type in your questions or comments, or why not uh, use send a text message uh, if you don't have any accounts. So we uh, so far no questions, Stefan. You have been all really clear. While we're waiting for some questions, I will take the opportunity to uh, promote the program. For, for the conference series. Uh, we will continue next week on Tuesday when it's Gunnar Westman from Chalmers 
who will present surface modification of non-crystalline cellulose. Thereafter, we take a short uh, Easter break. And on the Tuesday after Easter, there is a docent lecture at KTH by Lauren McKee that will be streamed. For that, you need, there is a, a separate link that's found on the webpage. So Stefan, we got a, we, uh, Apostolos Vagias writes in, Dear Professor Roth, thank you very much for the great presentation. In page 15, uh, have you considered the impact of relative humidity for future experiments? 15, yes, of course. Um, this is a very good question. The relative humidity, I must just lower the zoom window. Um, the, the relative humidity influences the drying time. Here we had a relatively low humidity between 20 to 30 uh, percent. And you can, of course, extend the drying stage when you have a high humidity in a local, in a local environment or local confined environment. For the experiment here, we to, uh, stuck, uh, stuck to, other, to, to our standard humidity in the experimental conditions. And uh, this served as a, um, as a model system to develop the methodology for this layer by layer coating. So in future, yes, we will do it. We have already done experiments by varying humidity. I will take a second question by Apostolos. Uh, another question on page 21. Uh, do you anticipate higher level of aggregation in the ens enzymatic cellulose? Even well, very good question. Again, um, um, if yes, in that sense, yes, uh, because uh, due to the charge of the temper oxidized cellulose, nanofibrils, as I said, we expect a stratification, hence less entanglement. But we haven't looked into detail into this specific question. Our idea was here to look, as I showed here on the last slide, uh, into the, uh, the, the nanoscale modification of hydrodization to understand the nanoscale structure. And then we have Daniel Söderberg who writes, uh, hello Stefan, although being a part of this work, I wonder about the time resolution for studying dynamics, how fast can you measure? Yeah. Um, so uh, if we go back to this slide here, um, you see here at that time in 2016, we were due to the experimental conditions uh, able to resolve 50 milliseconds. This has now been increased to 100 milliseconds. And in principle, one can look into high-speed experiments in the order of 1,000 frames per second. So you can really follow, for example, the evolution of the spray cone until it lands on the surface and then look into the detailed nanostructure and using correlation spectroscopy, you can be even um, much faster. And in the future, of course, as we will at, uh, uh, at DZ, as we hope to get uh, the next upgrade, when we are thinking of going into the nanosecond or well below microsecond regime to follow the structural modifications during processing on this time scale. So we have Apostolos who says, thank you very much for your answer. And then we, Anastasia Ryatsinova uh, says, many thanks for your presentation. And uh, that's all uh, the comments that we have right now. Shall we wait some more seconds to give them sure. a chance to say something? You in the audience, take the opportunity now that we have Stefan here. Or if you, Stefan, has something to add. Well, I hope that uh, everyone enjoyed it and I appreciate the collaboration with KTH.
now we have Eva Malmström who okay. writes in. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Do you observe any differences in organization between the films of the differently charged uh, DOC enough? Um, I have not uh, shown this. Indeed, there are small changes. I hope I can show this. Um, uh, yeah, there are very small uh, changes for the la for the highly charged. Um, they are, with our analysis, slightly within the error bars. We expect slightly. Uh, larger intermediate structures with higher charge or larger separated structures, so to say, with higher charge, which, ex which explains this uh, stratification I was talking about. Yeah, so higher charge means that basically, if you, even if you have agglomerations, agglomeration should be slightly larger apart. And uh, this is at the limit of the error bars, so to say. So I would expect yes, but we have to do more research on this. And I think that was the final question and final comments. So thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you. For doing this presentation. And thank you to all who listened. And we'll be back next week. Bye.